I could try to say more, but I think it is time for us to, to shift register, uh, to move from prose to poetry. Um, so I'll now hand over to uh, Bob's daughter, Emily. experiences of psychoanalysis to the majority of you here. Um, I suppose I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with, with it, I'd say. <laughs> a little bit like a parent-child relationship, I think. In that um, there are times when I do think that psychoanalysis does have a lot of answers to a lot of the questions that I would like to understand, but there are times when I just don't want it interfering with my life. <laughs> <laughs> so when Dan asked me to write a poem for today, I was honoured, but a little bit daunted, um, which wasn't helped by the fact that what he said he wanted was a light-hearted but serious poem, <laughs> <laughs> a, a daughter's perspective on psychoanalysis, but then as you all know, he never asks for easy things, does he? So I spent some time mulling it over, you know, catching up on my clinical line, a bit of bedtime reading of the dictionary, <laughs> and I contacted some you as well to ask you know what you thought of him and his work and stuff and thank you to those of you that sent me some information. I've tried to get the essence of it into the poem but um, as you'll appreciate I want it to be a daughter's perspective on psychoanalysis and I think that if there's anything that kids are really good at and I know this from my own experience with my own kids is that they're very good at reminding you that you are just human. <laughs> So after a day like today, I think you need that day. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I have to credit Carl um, for uh, giving me the, the idea for the structure of the poem. Um, because obviously, like an academic paper with a poem, you do need a structure, a concept, something to hang the ideas on. And what he said to me in one of his emails was that he was very surprised at how interested Dad is in racehorsing. Sorry, racehorses. And um, this is obviously since he's met Gillian, his lovely partner, who's passionate about horses. And between the two of them, they have bred this racehorse, which you probably saw pictures of, uh, and I need one from upstairs, um, when we were having lunch. This is the racehorse that they have bred. Uh, it's called Joe Castor, um, who is the mother of the So that's a bit skewy, which is Joe Castor's male. Um, anyway, uh, so they've bred this racehorse. Um, uh, trained it, had it trained, it raced, um, and um, although Dad has sort of said that he sees horses as being the dumbest creatures on earth, he does actually pay, he paid a lot of interest in Joe's progress and invited us all to the races. I lost a hell of a lot of money on that horse. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I think I decided it would be quite a good metaphor for the poem because um, like Dad, Joe is retiring this year, um, and uh, although he's obviously had a shorter career and written a lot less books, <laughs> <laughs> I think it struck quite a chord with Dad because um, there's been a lot of discussion and debate over the summer about you know now that Joe's back home all the time, it's going to make a lot of changes to, <laughs> to the way things are at home and with the other horses and stuff. So the decision has been made to cut his balls off. <laughs> <laughs> and quite likely, Dad had concerns in that. <laughs> so, the poem is set on a race course. Um, I don't know how serious it is, but it's definitely a daughter's life on perspective on psychoanalysis. There's a lot of poetic license, and obviously my uh, use of psychoanalytic terms and concepts is extremely dodgy, and I apologise for that now. And I apologise also for lowering the tone. <laughs> um, yeah, what else? I think just one last thing I have to say, one note of reference in the poem, 
is the, the place Marshall and St. James. Um, you may not have heard of it, but it is where Dad, Gillian and Joe and all the horses live now. So that's a reference to that. And I have been practicing my race course commentator's voice. Uh, so <laughs> that's why I've been talking to funny. And I have found that if I put my finger in my ear, it sounds better to me anyway. So that's why I've been doing that. It's called Hinshelwood Cup. Well, they're all in the stalls and they're ready to race. We've got Ego wearing stars and subconscious with his face to the sky. There's Paranoid Cycles with his eyes peeled wide, checking horses to his left, checking horses to his right. On the far lane in brown, that's anal fixation. <laughs> there's envy and fear of complete annihilation. Anxiety, remorse, that's a worried looking horse. And <laughs> Super Ego checking the dimensions of the course. And they're off. They're off to the sound of the shot. Ego gets off briskly to a swift but steady trot. His silks are quite dishevelled and his mane is somewhat coarse. But this horse has got ambition. This horse is ticked to win. He's got very strong opinions and he's trained with cast iron discipline. And fast behind him, narcissism, charged with raw eroticism, almost glued to Ego's tail and prancing like some Chippendale. Then his envy close in third, aroused by some absurd thing he's convinced he's overheard. Is he trying to eat another horse? <laughs> then it's death instinct in fourth, just ahead before remorse, and the rest are strung out on the track with anal fixation at the very back. <laughs> now they're coming up to the very first jump. There's a jostle and a mumble. Narcissism is stood staring at his picture in a puddle. <laughs> <laughs> Paranoid cycles bumps him twice and an early inhibition says, that's not nice. <laughs> Ego's near the jump, he's still in the lead. He's dictating conference papers as he thunders at top speed. Then his envy, then his super ego shouting to the horse, saying, if you carry on like this, it'll end up in divorce. But look at him run, he's nose to the front, now shoulder to shoulder, despite being older and sold for a pittance and a pee to a socialist, non-competitive, therapeutic community. <laughs> What tenacity, look at them fly, instincts at their heels, now totally blind, and it's anal fixation, anal fixation coming up behind, and look at the hurdle, there's three of them down, karate in the necks by the kicker, the bucker, Oedipus complex, the little motherfucker. We've, we've lost narcissism, we've lost inhibition, and depressive position is down. But there, on the outside, running tall, a bolt from a colt giving it his all. It's castration anxiety. He's running for his balls, but he falls. He's bound to his cost. He can't take the hurdle with his back legs crossed. <laughs> but he's up and he's over. He's gaining ground. Paranoid cycles is flipping round and round. With God, this race is losing sense. Fantasy is hurtling straight at the fence at a union punter in the crowd. <laughs> and they're all running wild like a really bad dream. However hard you analyse it, fuck knows what it means. <laughs> it's hypnotic, exotic, erotic, a mind gone psychotic, all meaning unclear. What do you have to do to get an analyst round here? <laughs> Ego's cut free. Is he leaving the game? It looks like he's heading for Marshland St James, where he'll graze in the pasture and drink red wine and write some more papers on Melanie Klein. <laughs> but there is one horse still clinging to the race, hopping with a tortured expression on his face, and with a final whip and a last giddy up, castration anxiety wins the cup. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.